All right. Um, uh, my name is Dan Blondell, and I'm the CEO of, uh, of Nano One, and I'm going to walk you through our story. Tracy, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and, and uh, present to your audience and, and your crowd. It's, been, it's an honor to be here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just walk you through the team. Uh, the guy up there on the right-hand side, you recognize him, except that photo is about uh, 10, years, um, uh, uh, 10 years ago, so my hair's uh, lost all its pigment since then. The, uh, I'm not going to go through everyone on, this, on, the, uh, on the slide deck here, but I'm going to focus on just on a few key people. Dr. Stephen Campbell is our uh, lead scientist, principal scientist, and he came to us from Ballard Power Systems and also from the Automotive Fuel Cell Corporation, which was a, a Daimler-Benz uh, Ballard Ford spin-off that, uh, that is still, uh, still a very viable entity today. Um, he's probably one of the best electrochemists in the world, and uh, we're very happy to have him on board. Um, many of you will know Paul Matissic. He's the chairman of Nano One, um, also at Lithium X. And uh, Paul, of course, is a bit of a legend in the, uh, um, in the resource space. He's probably generated between two and three billion dollars in enterprise value uh, in the various companies that he's brought, uh, brought to market in the last uh, six, to, six to eight years. And lastly, I want to talk to you about uh, Joe Lowry. He's an advisor to the company. He is known as Mr. Lithium. I think Joe himself probably moves about 1% of the world's lithium, brokering it between uh, the battery players and the lithium miners. Uh, he is very, very plugged in in Asia. He lived for a dozen years in Japan and China trading lithium. And he's basically on, he's on the market right now doing, uh, doing consulting work, doing advisory work. Of course, he's brokering lithium. And he's able to bring the kind of connections we need to bring our business to the next stage. And we'll be walking you through that as we get through the presentation. First of all, a little bit of a lithium-ion uh, battery primer for those of you who don't understand what a lithium-ion battery is. It's not just lithium in a can. There's a whole bunch of things that go in there. We've been talking about cobalt. We've been talking about graphite. There's also nickel. There's also manganese. Sometimes there's iron. Sometimes there's aluminum. There's many different flavors of lithium-ion batteries. And uh, it, uh, the graphite is the anode. That's one of the electrodes. And the cobalt and the nickel and the manganese are combined in different proportions for different types of behaviors and different types of properties on the cathode material. They basically, they, they get mushed and formed into an ink and spread onto these foils. And they're either rolled into a, a, a cylindrical cell, like a double A cell, or they are folded into a flat cell, like you might find in the back of your cell phone. The uh, cathodes are complex. Uh, increasingly, as we move into the electric vehicle space and the energy storage space, we're adding more and more elements. So we're, we're reducing the amount of cobalt, we're adding more manganese, we're putting in uh, aluminum, we're putting in dopants and coatings and, all, coatings and all kinds of things. Nano One's wheelhouse is on the cathode. We are developing technology to improve the way you assemble lithium, nickel, and manganese and cobalt into these, uh, into these energy storing materials. The cathode is about 25% of the, of the cell. So there's 7,000 cells in a, in a Tesla battery. Each one, in each one of those cells, you know, the can and everything included, cathode is about 25% of the cost of making that cell. Today, it's about a $3 billion market. It's easily going to get into the, uh, uh, into the tens of billion dollars in the 2020s. There are a number of different flavors of lithium-ion batteries, as I said. Those acronyms you see on the, on the, right, on the left hand, or right hand side of the graph are uh, lithium iron phosphate, lithium manganese oxide, nickel cobalt aluminum oxide. They're all different lithium ion batteries. They're used in different applications. You can see some of the household brand names up there that are using these. These are all lithium ion battery cathode materials. Nano One's technology can make all of them. Um, we have, uh, we're basically agnostic to, to which materials get used in, in different kinds of batteries. So we're positioned very well as the market shifts from one technology to another or as certain applications um, start to take over in certain areas. The, um, while we're, we're sort of talking about the, the players upstream uh, or downstream in the battery space, I want to walk you through what the lithium-ion battery supply chain looks like. So we, we've been talking about cobalt and nickel. We've been talking about the resource space largely here today. But what happens to those resources once they're, they're mined, processed, upgraded, is they get rolled into a cathode. Oops. They get rolled into a, um, a cathode material. 
uh, and into a cell and eventually into a battery pack. We see there's four different levels in, in, the, in the space. You've got your mining, you've got your value-added materials, you've got your battery cells, and then you've got your, your, your uh, battery pack, which includes a battery management system and all the microelectronics to control charging, discharging, cooling, heating, and all that stuff. There are many different players, uh, of course, in the market, and there's at various levels of the, uh, of the, of the supply chain. Our technology is focused on making the cathode material. So again, it's a chemical assembly process for, for putting together lithium, nickel, manganese into structured materials. We're aligning atoms in a bulk manner into these, uh, into these powders. We add value across the supply chain. So we have a, our methodology allows uh, cathode companies or, or battery companies to use a wider grade of lithium. So the industry is moving more, to warm, more and more towards what's called lithium hydroxide. We can enable lithium carbonate. It's a cheaper raw material going into the battery. We don't need to grind or mill the lithium beforehand. We don't need to crystallize it. So we can actually provide the lithium mining industry with, a, with a basically a, a sales channel where they can, get, they can get away with bringing a lower cost uh, lithium supply into the market. So that's one of, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. We also reduce costs on the, on the manufacturing of the materials. We bring higher performance to the, to the cells themselves. And, uh, and of course, we can because we can make all kinds of different materials, we're kind of agnostic. We have many different applications, whether it be phones, uh, laptops, uh, power tools, electric vehicles, storage. Um, those are all applications that we can address with our technology. So let's dive a little bit into the lithium space. Um, lithium, there are really two forms of lithium that are being used in, uh, in batteries today. And so it, it either comes, comes out of the ground as a, a lithium chloride or lithium sulfate, depending on whether it's a a brine or a hard rock mine, but eventually it gets converted into lithium carbonate and then, and then, and then it will be upgraded to hydroxide. The, you can see the price in hydroxide is quite a bit higher than the carbonate. That inflection you see um, is largely the, uh, uh, the recognition from the supply chain that, uh, that demand is going to outstrip supply in the lithium market in the foreseeable future. So that's driven the, the price up of both of, those, uh, both of those products. However, the difference between the hydroxide and the carbonate has been driven by the electric vehicle industry. The electric vehicle industry has decided they need hydroxide to make an electric, high performance electric vehicle battery. We at Nano One believe we can make carbonate quite uh, a, 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 basically the feedstock going into lithium ion batteries. So we think we can, uh, we can go after this price gap. We see it as an opportunity because we can uh, work with the mining companies, with the cathode companies to drive down prices and actually open up the supply chain, basically make more lithium available for battery grade purposes. So why is that? I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to tell you how we make, uh, how we make these materials today. Uh, we, not, not we, but the industry typically will take lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt, and they run them through two different, um, uh, basically two different product streams. The lithium will can be converted into a carbonate, a hydroxide, it'll get ground and milled, it'll get crystallized, and you get this fine powder out at the end. It gets mixed with nickel, manganese, and cobalt powders, ground and milled, and mixed together so that there's a uniform mix, and then it gets thrown in a kiln or a furnace, cooked at about 800, 900 degrees. Everything melts and coalesces together until you get these structures that are able to store lithium ions during the charge and discharge cycle. In uh, Nano One's process, we actually amalgamate these two uh, streams into one. So we have one product stream. And instead of doing it mechanically, we do it chemically. We do it in water in an aqueous process, relatively low pH. It's easy to, to permit. And uh, we dissolve lithium and nickel and manganese and cobalt into an aqueous solution. And we're able to, uh, to make a powder out of that that then goes into the furnace. The difference is, is that powder has a very, very, uh, the atoms are very closely aligned because we did it all in solution. When you, when you dissolve stuff, all the atoms are basically free atoms. There's no, no structures. When you dry it, they all, uh, they all uh, come together in a, in a structure and a mix that is very intimate. So it's one product stream, and it's all based on our, our proprietary technology, which is in the reactor itself, in this liquid reactor. So we're going to take a little bit of a closer look. What comes out of our reactor is a structured material. So that's the powder under a scanning electron microscope, and you can see those looks hexagonal uh, chips. They're about uh, 10 nanometers wide, which is about 50 atoms thick. And those structures, those hexagons, are an indication that we're forming crystal structures before we get to the furnace. 
Once we go through the furnace, it forms an entirely different structure. So there's a chemical process that goes on in the furnace. And, but, but it doesn't take long. We've converted uh, what takes days to fire in a furnace into hours simply because we're more effectively mixing those materials together. It also enables us to, uh, to use lithium carbonate because we don't care if it's lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide because we're going to dissolve it in water anyways. We don't care if it's ground or milled. We don't care what its crystallinity is. So we're, we've all of a sudden taken this very narrow specification for battery good lithium and widened it. And uh, we believe that it will have tremendous value in the supply chain. Um, the, uh, some of the other uh, value propositions are on the battery side of things. So when we take our material and we form a, a, a lithium ion battery with it, we will get, uh, in this, it will, we'll get longer lasting materials. In this particular graph here, um, what you see is a, uh, the green line represents nano one's uh, cathode material in a battery, and the gray line is a, uh, is a commercial material made into exactly the same battery. We've tested these over many, many cycles. About the life cycle of your cell phone, 500 cycles is about what your, uh, uh, before your, your, your battery starts to really decay on your phone, that's about two years worth of play. And you can see that the gray line degrades much faster, the green line less so. And what that, that, that is uh, uh, the result of probably uh, about two to three times more energy storage in the battery itself over its lifetime. That means if we can deliver longer lasting batteries, longer lasting cells, the car manufacturers don't need to build their batteries out quite as big. One of the reasons car, the, the electric vehicle batteries are so big, because they know that it's going to look, it's going to be down here at the end of its life cycle, at the end of 10 years. So they have to build the battery up bigger so that, uh, so that it's, got, it's got more room to degrade over time. And uh, if we can deliver a, a longer lasting material, we can cut down the size, the weight, the cost, and of course increase the mileage of the electric vehicle itself. Another material that I alluded to earlier today is what we call our high voltage spinel or cobalt free material. So this has manganese and nickel in it, but there's no cobalt. And you can see the structure of the material looks very different. Um, it is a, it's what we call a, a high power material, so it's, you're able to charge this material very quickly and discharge it very quickly. And uh, we've made some very uh, significant improvements in the way this material is made. In fact, there isn't really anyone out there that's able to make the materials as effectively as we can. I'm not going to walk you through this graph because it starts to get a bit technical, but essentially we've, uh, we've removed some, some unsavory characteristics from this material and it's starting to draw the attention of the, of the Toyotas and the BASFs of the world because they're looking to these next generation materials uh, for, for next, gener next generation batteries. So it's high voltage, high power, longer lasting, and of course it's cobalt free. Now, um, we see this as a, as a next-gen material. We're still working on materials with cobalt in them, but we're also hedging our bets and working on materials without cobalt. The, uh, really, what we're trying to do is tackle the dollars per kilowatt hour. How much energy does it cost you to store uh, in a battery? And uh, effectively, uh, the lower cost is driven by raw material costs, processing, and of course, the scalability of the process. It's where most startups fail, is when they start to scale, uh, the, the, energy, the costs go way up. What the high performance, on the high performance side, it's driven by the technology, how we actually put those materials together. It's driven by the formulations. Different formulations have different performance characteristics. And it's also, for, it's also driven by the ability to make very, very uh, uh, pure crystal structures, because that's what stores the energy. Our target is a 25% reduction in the, in the manufacturing costs, uh, a 50% increase in the, uh, in the overall energy used in the material, and we think that'll, uh, that'll deliver, uh, it's our target, is to deliver about a 50% cost reduction in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour in the, uh, uh, in the battery materials themselves. We're developing, we've, we've designed a pilot plant, and uh, you can see here, these are the reactors um, in action right now. Uh, the, we've, had, we've got government Canadian government granting money behind them to the tune of about four and a half million dollars and we have an industrial partner in NORAM Engineering who's actually helping us design the plant. The, uh, this next slide unfortunately has a, has a, uh, a one minute uh, presentation in here. This is our plant being built. Uh, we started filming this in about January when everything was coming together but it'll take another minute Tracy to go through this. But, um, and what you're seeing there is you're seeing all the pieces of equipment juggled around. It's a bit like a Tetris game because everything has to be shuffled around in the small space. But the choreography is from one of my, my uh, key engineers. He's the forklift driver. 
Um, we have three patents issued on the process uh, and the technology. The, the, pat the, the, the pilot plant will allow us to simulate full-scale production, allow us to make larger volumes that we can actually bring to strategic players like Samsung, uh, LG, uh, Panasonic. It's going to de-risk scale up and it's going to provide a platform for us to license the strategy to those players. The construction completed uh, a couple weeks ago and we're in the middle of a testing phase right now. So testing is underway. Uh, we, the, the project is on budget and we have partners and discussions you know, in, uh, in progress right now with big European players and big Asian players as well. And we are currently financed in terms of the pilot um, uh, through 2018. So we're in a relatively good uh, healthy condition right now. And I think you'll be able to, this will just be the end. You'll have noticed a few people shuffling around in this presentation. Uh, there are various groups that we brought in. So the Canadian government came in and made an announcement. You might have seen the flags pop up there for a short second. That was a, a couple, um, about a month ago, they came in and made a presentation. And then we had Benchmark Minerals brought a group through uh, about two weeks ago into our plant. So um, those pictures are taken about once every minute. And of course, we filtered through many of them. Uh, this is really just a timeline of the of the uh, of Nano One. I'm not going to go through it in any detail. It just uh, the, the company was private uh, years ago. We took it public two years ago, and we've been uh, we've been quite successful uh, bringing in government funding. And of course, we have a very loyal shareholder base who continue to uh, uh, to invest in the company. We're very excited uh, as we move forward into this next phase of our uh, evolution. And uh, we expect to be working with uh, people in the battery space uh, this year in 2017. Thank you very much for uh, your time and attention and for the opportunity to speak to you.